world in so many dictatorships overseas. A great man named Solzhenitsyn became the hero of so many of us when he exposed the Soviet Union's extensive gulag system. Is this really the kind of a United States we want to create in name of fighting terrorism? Some have argued that nothing in Section 1021 explicitly mandates holding Americans without trial, but it employs vague language radically expanding the detention authority to include anyone who has substantially supported certain terrorist groups or associated forces. No one has defined what those ter terms mean. What is an associated force? Sadly, too many of my colleagues are too willing to undermine our Constitution to support such outrageous legislation. One senator even said about American citizens being picked up under section under this section of the NDAA, quote, when they say, I want a lawyer, you tell them, shut up. You don't get a lawyer, close quote. Is this acceptable in someone who has taken an oath to uphold the Constitution? Mr. Speaker, of course, I recognize how critical it is that we identify and apprehend those who are suspected of plotting attacks against Americans. But why do we have so little faith in our judicial system? Have we not tried in civilian court and won convictions of hundreds of individuals for terrorist or related activities? I fully support continuing to do so. But let us not abandon what is so unique and special about our system of government in the process. I hope my colleagues will join my effort to overturn this shameful section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. And I yield back. So here we go, folks. The, we're in the point of time when the evidence is here. It's being presented. It's not speculation. It's not my opinion. It's not my belief. It's not my conspiracy theory. In the days of 2012, what was considered conspiracy theory is now quickly becoming conspiracy fact as I've labeled the facts before you today and I shall continue to do that and shall devote my resources through this website and what I'm a part of to continue this drive and endeavor to bring freedom information to the people no spin is in 34 nations 45 states six continents throughout the globe our number two viewer is China, with pushing a thousand different viewers. Our number three viewer is Russia, with pushing 400 separate viewers. We're expanding. We're moving on up. We know it, and some of you do too. So, we're coming into the point of history when it's becoming popular again to be American. When it's becoming popular again, and trendy by some at least, that are understanding to get back to the roots of our constitution and development and where we came from. Being in a FEMA camp, being molested by the TSA, going through this and that and the other, or being a uh, secret whisk off in the middle of the night by the new National Defense Authorization Act doesn't sound attractive to me. Wealth, prosperity, health, happiness, and a future, I like that. Being in some prison cell and being tortured for us being a suspect of terrorism? That doesn't sound so appealing. So, here we are, folks. We're at an interesting point in time in humanity. So now you know what I'm doing. I present you with the question of what are you going to do about it? I'm Carrie Olanumi, signing off with NoSpinNewsSource.com. Check out these videos, and we'll see you back here next month. From now till then, take care of yourself and each other, and take not just a look at the website, but what would be my blog at blog.nospinnewsource.com for your Friday lowdown. I'm Carrie Illinumi, signing off. In meetings with Lavrov, Assad gave his assurances to meet with any of the opposition groups. But, in fact, all have refused to do so. 
What we're dealing with here are still the shadows of reality. In addition to known opposition groups, who are these unknown entities that are targeting and terrorizing civilians? The truth remains conveniently covered up through the spin of the medium. We may be barred from knowing all the details currently as they pertain to Syria, but we must remind ourselves the target is not Syria, it is Russia and China, and all other considerations will be twisted in order to meet that effect. Look at the bigger picture. Who is the world's biggest sponsor of unending war and bloodshed? Not only do the machinations of the British monarchy operate under the radar of the average citizen and lawmaker, it is the Queen who, in formal terms, is more powerful than even the American president. It's in the Queen's kingdom where, to this day, it is perfectly legal to stage, bankroll, and order terrorist action against any other nation from British soil. In 1997, EIR magazine ran an expose and called for international sanctions against Great Britain for harboring virtually every international terrorist organization operating around the world. The United States and other countries spoke of dual containment of Iran, Iraq, as well as sanctions against Sudan. But the evidence was piling up that it was London, not Khartoum, Tehran, or Baghdad, that was the world headquarters of terror. The networks of known terrorist Mohammed al Masari and recently executed terrorist Osama bin Laden declared holy war against the American presence in Saudi Arabia and were responsible for bomb attacks against mil military personnel in Riyadh and Iran. On March 23, 1997, the British newspaper The Independent and the BBC both publicized bin Laden's declaration of jihad against the American rule in the Persian Gulf. A month earlier, British Channel 4 had an interview with bin Laden in which he vowed to bring his jihad to 40,000 American civilians living in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This pronouncement was taken so seriously, the State Department of the United States issued a travel advisory to all Americans in Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, bin Laden himself was free to travel back and forth to his villa in London's trendy Wembley suburb and praise the British and French governments for distancing themselves from the policy of the United States in the Middle East. Although several foreign governments, including Peru, France, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Germany, Turkey, Nigeria, and even Libya had publicly identified London as the command center for terrorism, the British response was always the same. Since the terrorist actions were not directed against British interests, there was nothing that the government could or would do. If you understand what is sitting on top of the so-called human rights and immigration laws that have permitted London to become the international terrorist hub, you have demystified much of the chaos spreading through the world today. No legislation, no matter what majority backs it in the House of Commons and House of Lords, can become law unless the Queen affirms it by the 900-person Privy Council. Should the Queen wish to press charges against any of the terrorists harbored in London, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council is the highest court in the British Empire. It renders its opinion in secret to the Queen, who makes the final verdict in secret. Now reflect back to October. Muammar Gaddafi was deliberately killed as part of the intervention into Libya. Were he allowed to live and be questioned, what may he have revealed about the nature of the British global empire? What would have been known if Osama bin Laden had been questioned in captivity? What more would be covered up if we see another Libya carried out in Syria, leaving the door open for World War III with Syria and Iran as a spark plug. The empire has been in a process of disintegration, with the timetable being the collapse of the transatlantic system. The silly little queen, quite aware of this, is willing to ignite a conflict between Russia and China versus the United States. But in the United States, where unlike the queen's unchecked under the radar actions, we have a constitution that allows us to peacefully remove traitors from their position of power.
thereby granting the American citizenry more power than a monarch. But given the congressional support for all of Barack Obama's anti-constitutional British-backed policies, the question must be asked. Has the Privy Council been expanded to include the U.S. Congress? New fallout today from a controversial Super Bowl ad. Clint Eastwood is defending his appearance in a Chrysler commercial, saying there was, quote, nothing political about it. The commercial talks about the rebirth of the car industry, and some political writers say it comes across like a campaign ad for President Obama. Here's a little clip. All that matters now is what's ahead. How do we come from behind? How do we come together? And how do we win? Detroit's showing us it can be done. And what's true about them is true about all of us. This country can't be knocked out with one punch. We get right back up again, and when we do, the world's going to hear the roar of our engines. Yeah, it's halftime America. And our second half's about to begin. Well, Rich Lowry is editor of the National Review and a Fox News contributor. He took up this issue in his column today, calling the ad propagandistic and half-baked. What don't you like about it, Rich? Well, it's a very evocative ad, obviously. You just hear that voice, Megan. You want to salute and charge into battle. He's great at that kind of gravelly voice sense of uh, authority that only Clint, Clint Eastwood can deliver. But look, this is an ad that dovetails, and I don't think this is necessarily what Clint Eastwood intended, but it dovetails with the Obama administration's message. Both Chrysler and the administration want to portray these bailouts as a, a wonderful American success story. Says we all pulled together. And, right, and, and that was the other thing, is it really echoed the theme at the end of President Obama's State of the Union Address, where we need to put all this argument and discord behind us and just unite behind uh, uh, government policies that include massive bailouts. Of no bailouts, no handouts, and no cop-outs. And I, when I say change we can believe in, I didn't say change we can believe in tomorrow. Not change we can believe in next week. Stay the course. We will stay the course. We're just going to stay the course. We're going to stay the course. We must stay the course. We'll stay the course. This country will stay the course. We will stay the course. The Obama administration says if a political solution to the crisis proved impossible, it might consider other options. Now, this amid warnings that Washington's continuing efforts against the Syrian regime could see it fighting side by side with Al Qaeda. Artis Ganich to count reports. Amid bloodshed in Syria, more extremists are penetrating the country to help bring down Assad. That's according to U.S. intelligence which says Al-Qaeda-affiliated fighters were responsible for a series of deadly suicide bombings in Damascus and Aleppo, targeted at Syrian military and intelligence facilities. We've seen evidence of uh, uh, extremists, Sunni extremists, I can't label them specifically as Al-Qaeda, but a similar ilk who are um, infiltrating the oppositionist groups. <laughs> While fighting in Syria continues, the violence in neighboring Iraq has dropped, in some areas by as much as 50% in the last few months. This, as Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri has called on his supporters around the world to back the uprising in Syria. <laughs> These men, who call themselves the Mujahideen, say they're on their way to fight a holy war against Assad. In Washington, senators asked the head of America's intelligence, James Clapper, what happens if Assad falls. Are we prepared uh, for the situation of a possible failed state where Al-Qaeda enjoys a safe harbor and refuge uh, and from which to coordinate attacks? His response bears no optimism. There would be kind of a vacuum, I think, that uh, would lend itself to um, extremists uh, operating in Syria which is particularly troublesome. Some ask a different question. Is the U.S. on the same side as Al-Qaeda in Syria and whether its policies are indirectly aiding the terrorists? Uh, American strategists would have to be fools 
not to see what Al-Qaeda is doing, not to ask the question, if it's good for Al-Qaeda, can it be good for us? And not to look at Assad and say, he may be a ruthless dictator in what he's doing, but what comes after him when he falls? I think Al-Qaeda does its best work, or it works best when it finds a country that is fundamentally a failed state. This is why I am against putting weapons in and aiding the anti-Assad resistance, because an all-out war there could be a disaster which leaves a failed state in Syria. Uh, joining us uh, here today is Francis uh, Anthony Boyle, is a professor of international law university at the Illinois College of Law. He received his A.B. in 71 in political science from the University of Chicago and a J.D. degree magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. And he sat in the main office after that that Kissinger held. And A.M. and Ph.D. degrees in political science at Harvard University. He also practiced tax, international tax, uh, in Bingham, Dana, and Gold. Uh, he also participated in the International Tribunal of Indigenous Peoples of Oppression, uh, Nationalities, United States of America, the convened San Francisco, he also helped write the big biological weapons treaties. I don't have time to go over it all, but he's a leading expert. Uh, uh, Francis, you heard me preface you coming on with, we really do have a global corporate tyranny running Europe, running the U.S., that is overthrowing countries worldwide through proxies, that is building massive force up against the people and now admitting it's for us. What do you do when you're faced with a tyranny that's now out of the cradle, not crawling, on its on its legs, ready to attack. Well, thank you very much for uh, getting on, uh, Alex. Yes, the situation is uh, progressively uh, deteriorating. Uh, I remember uh, when you had your camera key team come in and uh, interview me six months after uh, President Obama was inaugurated. Uh, for your uh, documentary uh, on him being a threat to the public. And I had given Obama the benefit of the doubt for, uh, for six months. And after six months of uh, what he was doing, uh, I concluded that it, you know it, he was taking us down. Uh, and uh, uh, I had thought, since he had taught constitutional law, he was after me in Harvard Law School, maybe he would be proceeding to dismantle um, some of the police state, but it said he's made it worse. And that's why I gave you that, uh, that interview to, to blow the whistle uh, uh, on Obama. <clears throat> and look what he's done uh, since then. The uh, FISA Amendments Act that completely demolished the uh, Fourth Amendment. Uh, his murder list, uh, we now find out there are two of them. One uh, maintained by a uh, JSOC, one maintained by the CIA, uh, all approved uh, out of the White House, and U.S. citizens uh, are on that murder list. Uh, the NDAA, which Obama approved and indeed insisted, uh, uh, Senator Levin uh, pointed this out, uh, that uh, it also applied to U.S. citizens. Uh, it basically eliminated the uh, Posse Comitatus Act so that the uh, military can literally come in. Uh, pick you and me up uh, and uh, move us anywhere they want to. This is called enforced disappearances. It's an international crime. Uh, turn us over uh, to uh, some third country uh, to, to be tortured. Uh, Obama has said he'll continue the uh, Bush policy of extraordinary renditions, which means it's a euphemism for uh, uh, enforced disappearances. This is exactly what these uh, military dictatorships down in Latin America did with their uh, death squads. So now uh, Obama already has uh, death squads abroad, CIA and uh, JSOC, and with the NDAA, uh, he is, he's now in a position to start uh, uh, unleashing his, uh, his death squads, disappearance squads here in America.
summer of uh, 2006 by the FBI, CIA, when I refused to become uh, an informant on my uh, Arab and Muslim clients. Uh, so I'm very high uh, on this list. Uh, I'm, I'm at risk, certainly, of, uh, uh, as a result of the uh, NDAA and uh, Obama's murder list. America has no truer friend than Great Britain. Once again, we are joined together in a great cause. So honored the British Prime Minister has crossed an ocean to show his unity with America. Thank you for coming, friend. For more of that, check out blog.nospinnewsource.com. Nospinnewsource.com